Hey everybody, welcome to the Scripture Study Project, our podcast that gives you a fresh and faithful study of the Scriptures that will renew your excitement for your own personal study and help you passionately teach what you're learning to others. I'm Zach, and I am here with my absent-minded wife, Krista. Here's the story. She comes downstairs right before we're getting ready for our podcast, holding... Okay, this is PG-13, so if you've got kids, you can turn it off. (laughs) You should not say this. Holding her bra in her hands with gum stuck to the inside of the bra. And she said she's in church, and they were passing around cookies, and she was chewing gum. And so this is a direct quote. She pulls it out of her mouth and says, where should I put this? Oh, I'll just put this right here in my bra. (laughs) And then seven hours later realizes that it's still there. This is a horrible start to this part of this episode. It's a great way to start an episode. So, Anywho. Anyway, we are excited that you're here and excited to be with you this episode. This is episode 16, and the block for this is a little bit uh, confused, I guess. Our last episode was our Enos episode, and we meant to go from Enos through Omni, but ended up just doing Enos. And so we're going to pick up a little bit from Omni, and then we're going all the way through Mosiah chapter 6. This is King Benjamin's address. And we're going to try and cram it all into one episode. So here we go. Our study and teaching tip for the day, though, uh, comes from something I've been reading or that's been on my mind a lot and that I have read recently. This is from 3 Nephi chapter 19. And if you'll remember, this is in the middle of the Savior's visit to the Nephites. And at the beginning of chapter 19, he has just left. He's just concluded day number one. And he leaves further teaching and ministry to his 12 newly appointed apostles. And those apostles undertake to teach separate groups of Nephites. They've divided the congregation into 12. And here's how they teach. This is 3 Nephi 19, verses 6 and 7. Now 6 through 8. The 12 did teach the multitude. And behold, they did cause that the multitude should kneel down upon the face of the earth and should pray unto the Father in the name of Jesus. So there's their opening prayer. And the disciples did pray unto the Father also in the name of Jesus. And it came to pass that they arose and ministered unto the people. And when they had ministered those same words which Jesus had spoken, nothing varying from the words which Jesus had spoken, Behold, they knelt again and prayed to the Father in the name of Jesus. And that phrase, nothing varying from the words which Jesus had spoken, stood out to me because I've been paying very close attention recently in my own study and in my observation of teaching at how much power comes into a scripture study when we use the exact words that prophets, apostles, or the Savior himself use to teach doctrine and principle and to help explain doctrine and principle. I'm just thinking of Nephi quoting Isaiah. Hmm. I mean, he includes chapters and chapters of exactly a repeat of what Isaiah is saying. And then coming from our scripture block today, starting in Mosiah, the whole beginning of King Benjamin's speech is him talking about the importance of these records. I say unto you, my sons, were it not for these things which have been kept and preserved by the hand of God, that we might read and understand of his mysteries and have his commandments always before our eyes, that even our fathers would have dwindled in unbelief, and we should have been like unto our brethren. I love that part right there where it talks about that we may understand his mysteries and have his commandments. We need the scriptures, and we need to read them. We need them, not just need them, we need them in the way they were written. We need to, I guess, give more diligent heed to the phrasing, the divine phrasing that prophets, apostles, and God himself has put into the scriptures. Don't forget the power of the word. Yeah. To start off our study of King Benjamin's speech, we want to start off with a story, and this is actually from the most recent Enzyme, the March 2018 Enzyme. It's called Sunrise by Don Jensen. He is a farmer, and he says that he was out doing morning chores, and his mind was heavy, as I'm going to quote from him now. My mind was heavy as I reflected on the events of the past week. 
tragedy had struck our small valley. An old high school friend of mine, along with his young son and teenage daughter, and three of her three of her friends had been killed in a terrible car crash. My children had been friends with the girls in the accident. Our family and many others had spent the week grieving this tragedy, along with the other families involved. I was struggling with two main questions as I came to terms with what happened. First, I grieved for and wondered why these young children would be taken before they got to experience so much life has to offer. Secondly, although I felt that we as a community wanted so much to offer comfort for the families, it seemed that there was nothing we could do, no effort that could touch their grief. As I worked, I was surprised by a visit from the father-in-law of my friend who had died. As a fellow rancher where the work never stops, he needed to buy a calf immediately. After the transaction was made, we talked for a while about how he and his family were doing. I voiced to him my wish that I could do something more for them. I felt so helpless to ease their pain, but I was impressed at how calm and peaceful he seemed in spite of what his family was going through. Suddenly I realized that the answer to one of my questions had been there all along. I had been worrying about how to provide comfort to my grieving friends, forgetting that true comfort and peace comes through the Holy Ghost. These families were blessed with an added measure of that comfort from Heavenly Father that only He can provide. I knew that they were receiving the Lord's comfort. King Benjamin, in his speech, talks often of peace. So to lay this out in the scriptures, if you go back to Omni, there's this one line. Uh, if you know, Omni is kind of a unique book because Omni admits he's not a righteous man and he's merely keeping the records because he was commanded to do so. But in verse 3, as he's recounting Nephite history, he says, We had many seasons of peace, and we had many seasons of serious war and bloodshed. And I read that just the other day and thought, boy, doesn't that describe most of our lives, our relationships, our families, where we have seasons of peace, but of course, many seasons of war. In the words of Mormon, Mormon starts to introduce for us King Benjamin. And he says this introduction. And now concerning this King Benjamin, he had somewhat of contentions among his own people. And so in the next couple of verses, Mormon summarizes briefly what King Benjamin had done to, as he concludes in verse 18, by laboring with all of his might and his body and the faculty of his whole soul and also the prophets, he did once more establish peace in the land. At the beginning of Mosiah chapter 1, um, it mentions again that King Benjamin had continual peace all the remainder of his days. That contrast between seasons of peace that Omni describes and the continual peace that King Benjamin has brought to his people caught our attention. And as we thought about this, we realized that seems to be kind of a human endeavor to create lasting peace in an individual life. In chapter 4, verse 3, when King Benjamin takes sort of a pause in his address, uh, the people cry with a loud voice and they explain that they were filled with joy having received a remission of their sins and having peace of conscience. So whatever King Benjamin does, it brings peace to an individual soul. But there's more than that. He brings peace to families. He brings peace to um, a nation. And we want to study how he does that. So how can we not start with what King Benjamin starts with? So in chapter 2, verse 14, And even I myself have, la have labored with mine own hands that I might serve you. I love how he illustrates that peace takes work. Peace is not something that just comes. Um, it comes through laboring amongst his people. It comes through serving them, through serving together with them. And that is how that peace of conscience has come for him, is as he has served and in turn, he has seen, I'm really serving God as I do this. Just to maybe show the power of this principle, his son Mosiah will take over as king. And this is chapter 6, verse 7. 
Mormon says that Mosiah caused that his people should till the earth, and he also himself did till the earth, that thereby he might not become burdensome to his people, that he might do according to that which his father had done in all things. And there was no contention among all his people for the space of three years. And so I, Mosiah understands this principle learned from dad, that to have a peaceful people, to have a peaceful family, to have a peaceful soul, it takes work. It's not just something that can be prayed for or sermonized. And as you know so well, that King Benjamin continues on and teaches us this pattern of peace, that if we're starting with service, what comes next? And what comes next for him, we can read at the end of verse 17, when you are in the service of your fellow being, you are only in the service of your God. And in turn, he teaches in verse 18, Behold, ye have called me your king, and if I, whom ye call your king, do labor to serve you, then ought not ye labor to serve one another? And behold also, if I, whom ye call your king, who has spent his days in your service, and yet has been in the service of God, do merit any thanks from you, O oh, how you ought to thank your heavenly king. So that pattern that he's teaching us there is that when we serve others, we serve God. And when we serve God, we learn gratitude. One thing I found interesting in this is we, right before we recorded, we're wrestling with what the definition is of peace. And so I started scouring some sources and I came across this definition that I really liked. Peace is the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. I like the definition that peace is the tranquil state of a soul who is assured of its, here, connection with God, but I would also add its connection with other people. And so you think of where war and contention comes from. It's when we're not sure about the other person's or the other party's intentions towards us, or we're not sure that they're good intentions, right? In a relationship, I this is maybe a dumb example, but I think of high school relationships that for me were always fraught with stress and war because I was never sure that the girl that I liked liked me or liked me as much as I liked her. And so it was this constant state of turmoil. None of those relationships were peaceful. And so I like this principle that when we serve others, we create peace. If I want to make a more peaceful relationship with my children, I can't force them to create peace, but I can create it by serving them. The point that I caught in these chapters, at the very beginning, I've always liked, and, and maybe uh, you out there have noticed this as well, that the people that gather themselves to hear King Benjamin gather themselves in their families, this is chapter 2, with the door of their tent pointing towards the tower that King Benjamin erects to speak from. Uh, this is not a singular experience in Scripture, where a group of people will center themselves, where they will surround a central object. Uh, for example, when Moses is traveling with the children of Israel through the wilderness, uh, if you remember, they're bitten, they have that moment where they're bitten by the fiery serpents, and he, is, he builds or constructs that brazen serpent on a post and fastens it in the middle of the camp, in the center of everything. When later they build the tabernacle, they build the tabernacle at the center of camp and the 12 tribes arranged around it. Uh, in modern church history, when the church, when uh, Joseph Smith laid out the plan for Kirtland, the temple was the center. And of course, when we get to Salt Lake, that very same pattern follows where the temple is at the center of everything. And so this symbolic centering of things around a uh, King Benjamin's address, his tower, the prophet, or the temple, seems to be pervasive in Scripture. And so it's caused me to think about what is it that we put at our centers. And sometimes I've, I've illustrated it this way. So if you've got pen and paper and you want to draw something that I think will make a big difference, do this, or maybe just imagine it. Draw a big circle. And then inside of that big circle, draw a smaller circle, concentric with the bigger one. Uh, so when you're done, it should look kind of like a donut. Then in the outside between the two circles, uh, divide that into, I don't know, eight to 12 different 
wedge pieces. Leave the center circle untouched, but uh, draw lines connecting the outside ring of that center circle to the outer circle, if that makes sense. Uh, and inside each of those, write something that occupies time or space in your life. So I'm going to use my wife as an example. If we were to draw your circle, what would be some of the things that are that occupy time and space in your life. Just list them off and we'll imagine drawing them on this circle. Oh, geez, I should have been pre-prepared for this. My, let's see, washing dishes takes a lot of my time. <laughs> um, getting kids ready, spending time with them, um, doing household, I'd say like computer work, doing things for... Small seed. Small seed or mm. photography. Kind of some other things, church, church, callings. church things, um, friends and time with family and exercise. and Okay. So we got a good list there of things that take up time and space in life. Yeah. At the center of the circle, um, if we're not careful, we might look and say, well, it was King Benjamin that was at the center, or even it was the temple that was at the center. But remember, prophets at their core are the same as temples at their core. They point us to, of course, something higher and greater. So what was it these people were putting at their center? Um, King Benjamin, before he begins his sermon, pulls his son Mosiah aside. This is chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. And he tells Mosiah, I want you to gather the people tomorrow. And he gives him two purposes for his address. The first person he says, or the first purpose he says at the end of verse 10 uh, I shall proclaim unto this my people out of my own mouth that thou art king and a ruler over this people. So the first purpose of his address is to announce that Mosiah is going to be the new king. He accomplishes that purpose in one verse. Chapter 2, verse 30, Mosiah is king. Which means that the rest of chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5 all focus on the other purpose. And so in verse 11 in chapter 1, he says what the other purpose is. Moreover, I shall give this people a name, that thereby they may be distinguished above all the people which the Lord God hath brought out of this land of Jerusalem. And this I do, because they have been diligent in keeping the commandments of the Lord. I'm going to give them a name that's going to make all the difference in the world. In other words, I'm going to give them something that they can put at their center that will change their lives and give them continual peace. So what's the name? Here are the verses read in succession that hint at what that name is. Chapter 3, verse 17. Moreover, I say unto you that there shall be no other name given, nor any other way nor means whereby salvation can come unto the children of men, only in and through the name of Christ the Lord Omnipotent. Um, chapter 5, verse 7. And now, because of the covenant which you have made, you shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. Verse 8. Under this head, or this name, you are made free, and there is no other head whereby men can be made free. There is no other name given whereby salvation cometh. Therefore, I would that you should take upon you the name of Christ. And he goes on in the next couple of verses, repeating this idea over and over. This is the name I wanted to give you. This is the name that if you'll put at the center of your circle, will give you continual peace. So now we come back to your circle, and here's where we get it practical. I think a lot of times in our life, we are very tempted to take one of those wedge pieces and make it our center. Yeah. So for you, if you were to say, if you were, what's the most tempting center of all the things that you just named? I know you had a lot of them, but which one is the one that sometimes you feel, I don't know, sneaks into your center, the one that kind of governs the others, that influences your emotions maybe more than anything else? Laundry? <laughs> <laughs> laundry. Yes. I want to center my life on laundry. Um, yeah, I think I sometimes want to center my life on exercise just because it's this even though I'm not doing it as much right now as I should be, but it sounds nice to have that be like this, oh, I want to spend an hour or two a day doing that, and it's a good time for me to 
You know, there's a yeah. lot of positive things that I can put that with. A lot of negative things that come when you don't, right? Yeah, that's true. So this is a really good example because when you're, and we know this just from experience, right? When you're able to exercise in the morning, the day goes much better, right? Everything goes better. You're happier about laundry. You uh, work better with the kids. You uh, It just seems like your day goes much better if you have... Well, it's because I'm prepared for the day. I think, I mean, you know, that's, that's interesting to think about because, yeah. But when you don't get the chance, a lot of times that throws you into a funk, right? The the day feels kind of stale and, and weird and Mm -hmm. unless you get that chance to exercise. Now that's a very mild example, but my guess is if you're looking at your own circle, you're thinking, yeah, there are some things there that creep into my center. There's some things that if they go good or bad, start impacting other areas of my circle. Um, I work with teenagers for a living and they're very tempted to put their peers at the center of their circle. Sometimes it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or sometimes it's just a peer, but that center then governs everything else. So you go to school on any given day and the girl that you like smiles at you and all of a sudden everything goes great. You're an all-star in class. You're great at tennis practice after school. You go home and you're nice to your family. You get good sleep. You wake up the next day, you go back to school and that same girl gives you a crusty look and everything falls to pieces. Or uh, let's say that sports are at the center of your circle and you're doing, you have a great game or a great practice, everything else goes well, but let's say you break your leg or you get injured or you get demoted from the A-team and all of a sudden everything else seems to fall to pieces. As you're talking about this, I'm thinking maybe a better one, a better example for me at this stage in my life could be centering my life on my kids. Because it's also like I kind of am forced to center my life on my kids because I'm constantly serving and Mm -hmm. thinking about them. But I also can't let myself get caught up in those same things that you're talking about with like a a girl, high school kids, girlfriend, or, but like if my kids have a bad day or if, um, you know, maybe they're just having an off day and aren't responding well to me or I can't let that get me down. Yeah. So the conclusion is none of those wedge pieces, even good ones like family, or I would even say church, cannot be a center of a circle because none of those things is consistent, right? Even church is filled with mortal members and mortal people that make mistakes. And if your life is centered on the organization of the church, you're going to be disappointed and you will never find continual peace. It'll always be seasonal. If things are going well, if you like your calling, you'll be happy and have peace. You don't like your calling, you don't like your ward members, you won't have peace. And so we constantly experience this up and down, these seasons of peace, because we have centers in our life that are not safe centers. And I think what King Benjamin is trying to teach, what the angel teaches him in the vision he receives, and what he's trying to convey to his people with chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5 that aren't about Mosiah being king is... There's only one name. There's only one thing you can put at your center because there's only one thing that if at your center will never go up and down, will never be hit or miss. Jesus Christ never writes you angry text messages. He doesn't break up with you. He doesn't scowl at you. He doesn't give you dirty looks. He doesn't have bad days. And so to put him at your center is to put something that is consistent and calming and something upon which we can build safely and something that that influences the other wedge pieces in our life positively so that we can have continual peace. And talking back about this pattern that we talked about, the pattern of peace, this verse in chapter 4, verse 6, you can just, I mean, we all know this. We love King Benjamin. We love his address because it's kind of that, just he's so full of, that trust because he trusts God. He says in verse six, I say unto you, if ye have come to a knowledge of this goodness of God by going through the pattern, Mm -hmm. by experiencing his love, his peace and his matchless power and his wisdom and his patience and his long suffering toward the children of men and also the atonement, which has been prepared from the foundation of the world. He teaches some beautiful things about the atonement in these verses, in these chapters that they're, that thereby salvation might come to him that should put his trust in the Lord and should be diligent in keeping his commandments and continue in faith even unto the end of his life. I mean the life of the mortal body. Oh, we trust and we 
are diligent in keeping the commandments because we continue to see, and King Benjamin has seen, that God is good and he's faithful yeah. in what he says he's going to do. This is chapter 5, verse 11. I would that you should remember that this is the name that I said un- that I should give unto you that never will be blotted out except it be through transgression. Transgression. Therefore, take heed that you do not transgress, that the name may not be blotted out to yourselves. But then verse 12, I say unto you, I would that you should remember to retain the name written always in your hearts, that you are not found on the left hand of God, but that you hear and know the voice by which you shall be called, and also the name by which he shall call you. For how knoweth a man the master whom he has not served? and who is a stranger unto him, and is far from the thoughts and the intents of his heart. Our conviction is, if you will put Christ at the center of your life, not that you can't have other things in your life, but if you'll make him your center focus, you will feel that continual peace. How do you make him that center focus? You serve him by serving others. And when you serve others, you're brought closer to him, you're filled with gratitude, and he becomes the center of your life. And you can experience continual peace. And I'd say that your family can be the same way, or your Mm -hmm. relationships can be the same way, that as we look to serve God and love people the way that he loves us, and that continual love and and peace that he brings us, um, we can come to have better relationships. And we are not saying this because we're perfect at it. Um, but I really believe that it comes as we draw closer to him, that we can begin to feel more of his peace in our own selves, but also exude more of that peace. Well, thank you so much for being with us this episode. Uh, we've enjoyed the study. It was a big one. But we hope that it makes a difference for you. We hope that you can say like King Benjamin's people say in chapter 5, Yea, we believe the words which thou hast spoken unto us. And also we know of their surety because the Spirit of the Lord Omnipotent has wrought a mighty change in us that we have no more disposition to do evil but to do good continually. We hope that it's made that kind of, the King Benjamin's words have made that kind of a change for you as they've made that kind of a change for us. Uh, we have an Instagram account that we have just begun recently. It is the Scripture Study Project. So if you'd like to follow us, we are going to be posting regularly on that account Scripture Study Tips, Scripture Study Insights, and of course, podcast updates. Uh, so if you'd like more Scripture Study Project throughout your week, follow us on Instagram. Uh, spread it around to other people. We would love for this, for the Book of Mormon to reach as many people as possible. So if you know someone that could use this episode or any of our previous episodes, or could maybe just use little pick-me-up in their scripture study, uh, share the podcast, have them like our, or follow us on Instagram. As always, we'd welcome insights and comments from you and feedback and any way that we can help serve you better. And we will see you next episode. Thank you. Thank you.